Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video. I know this episode of Halloween is a little bit late and I apologize for that. However, we still do have two more crazy cases to cover. So you will be having this video as well as another true crime video to wrap up Halloween weekend. And I want to say thank you guys so much for all of your support this year on Halloween. It's been so cool to see how excited you guys have been about Halloween and it's really just made the process of researching these cases and covering them that much more enjoyable for me and interesting and motivating because I know you guys really want to hear it so thank you so much for making Halloween possible again this year and I hope that we will be able to do it again next year before we get into it today I want to thank today's sponsor which is Nord VPN now if you don't know what a VPN is a VPN stands for a virtual private network now what does a VPN do you might be asking well essentially a VPN helps secure your own online privacy and security. A VPN is the perfect option for people who want an extra layer of protection when they are browsing the web online. It's also great if you want to get access to blocked websites. For example, if you want to access YouTube in a place where it isn't available. A VPN is also great if you are someone who uses a public Wi-Fi, whether that be at a coffee shop, an airport, a hotel, or anything like that. You'll really want a VPN because it makes it way more difficult for hackers to get a hold of your information. Personally, I'm someone who definitely needs to know that my information is being kept secure when I'm on a public Wi-Fi, which is why NordVPN has been an absolute must for me. I have been hacked before, and if you have also been in that same boat, you know how crucial it is to use a system that you can trust to protect you. Now, if you guys want to try out NordVPN for yourself and get started on protecting your internet safety, you can get 68% off of a two-year plan plus one additional month for free when you go to nordvpn.com slash killer instinct or use the code killer instinct at checkout this offer makes your subscription at nordvpn just three dollars and 71 cents a month and it is risk-free with nord's 30-day money-back guarantee that again is nordvpn.com slash killer instinct thank you nordvpn for sponsoring this video and now let's move on to the case so as you guys can tell by the title of today's video today we are talking about chelsea brooke i feel like chelsea's story is is definitely a case that I have seen many creators cover when they do their hollow weeks or hollow weekends or however they do it but it is never a case that I have covered and it's always been a case that I've remembered Chelsea's case has always stuck with me throughout the years since I first heard about it so let's jump right on into it so this is Chelsea Chelsea was born on January 28th 1992 in Trenton Michigan to her parents Leanda and Matt Brooke Chelsea was the youngest of five children so she had four four older siblings, and they all grew up in a town called Maybe, Michigan. I think that that is like the best name for a town ever. And to give you some context, Maybe is a very, very small town. There's about 600 people who live in it, so it was kind of like an everyone knows everyone situation. Now, Chelsea was described as a really nice girl. She was friendly, she was wholesome, and after living in Maybe for a couple years, Chelsea was ready to start a new adventure. She wanted to move to a place where there was more people. She wanted to move to a different town and just kind of start fresh you know some people when they grow up in a small town they find comfort in that and they never leave and they just are comfortable living in that type of lifestyle however some people it has the opposite effect and it really urges them to want to start completely fresh in a town that's completely different and that's exactly what ended up happening with Chelsea and when she had the chance she ended up moving to a place called Monroe County Michigan so let's move to the year 2014 Chelsea was 22 years old and this year in particular she was really really excited because she was going to be going to a Halloween party. Something to note about Chelsea is that she absolutely loved Halloween. Halloween was her favorite holiday. She absolutely loved dressing up and getting into costume and really getting into the spirit. She was all about it. So because of that Chelsea was really looking forward to this party and this was not just any little house party. This was a huge huge party. This party was called Big Mike's Halloween Bash and it was being held on October 25th, 2014. And Chelsea was planning on going to this party with her co-worker Becky. According to Becky, she said everyone knew that Big Mike always had the biggest Halloween parties. This was a tradition for him. He did it every year and Big Mike was a guy who was in a heavy metal music band. So his band would perform at his parties 
and he kind of named himself Big Mike. Monroe County was home to a lot of farmers and Big Mike also lived on a farm. He was known to have parties before that Chelsea had also been to and she had a really good time at. Nothing bad had ever happened at them, so there was no reason to believe that anything bad would happen this time either. So Becky and Chelsea decided that they were going to go to this party together dressed up as Batman villains and Chelsea in particular was going to dress up as Poison Ivy. Chelsea was really into her costume. She spent weeks leading up to the party making it. She took a green bodysuit and personally sewed on each artificial leaf to the bodysuit. She also wore a dark red wig and according to Becky, Chelsea was really, really proud of the costume that she had come up with. So let's explain the setup of this party so you can really get a good visual. So this party had two giant tents set up outside on a farm. Like we said, Big Mike lived on his mother's farm, so he used his entire property of land for this Halloween party. So he set up two giant tents, and in total, there were about 700 people at this Halloween party. There were eight different heavy metal bands that were set up to play throughout the night, including Big Mike's band, which is called the Pickaxe Preachers. So Becky and Chelsea went to this party together and they also went with another girl. And this other girl's name is Penny Watkins. Penny was 10 years older than Chelsea, but the two of them were really close. Penny said that the two of them were basically attached at the hip. So it was the three of them together, Becky, Chelsea, and Penny. And around midnight, Big Mike ended up lighting this giant bonfire and it attracted a lot of people around it. Chelsea and her two friends went over to the bonfire. It was said that Chelsea bumped her nose at some point in the night and it ended up bleeding, but everyone was kind of drinking so they all just laughed it off and she didn't seem too bothered by it. Now the plan that was made prior to the party was that Chelsea was going to be driven home by Penny once the girls left. So it was about one o'clock a.m. and Penny decided that it was time to go. They all needed to go back home because Penny's sister had work really early the next morning. However, sometime around this time period is when Chelsea ended up getting lost from her friends. Neither Becky nor Penny was able to locate Chelsea, and Becky was actually holding on to Chelsea's phone because Chelsea's costume didn't have pockets, so Becky was holding on to Chelsea's phone, so there was no way for them to call Chelsea to see where she was at. And there were 700 people at this party, so they had no idea where to even begin in looking for Chelsea. Now, like I said, Penny's sister, who was also at the party, had work early the next day. She had to get up at 6 a.m. So she really wanted to get home. She wanted to get home and go to bed. That way she can at least get a little sleep before she had to wake up. And Penny at this point kind of took the side of her sister and decided that it was best if she did take her sister home. So Penny and Becky ultimately ended up leaving Chelsea behind, thinking that she would just find her way home some other way. Because Penny and Becky and their their mindset they thought you know Chelsea doesn't know just us Chelsea had other friends at the party as well so if we leave Chelsea can still get a ride back from another friend of hers at this party they didn't think it was that big of a deal however the following day on October 26th Becky woke up and realized she still had Chelsea's cell phone so Becky decided that her best bet in order to get Chelsea's cell phone back to her was to call Chelsea's mother so she ended up calling Chelsea's mom and telling her that she had Chelsea Chelsea's phone and that Chelsea could come pick it up whenever she wanted. However, this is when Chelsea's mom told Becky that Chelsea never made it home from the party the night prior. Now, according to Becky, her first thought was maybe instead of immediately going home, Chelsea went home with a friend and was just hungover and slept off the hangover and was going to go home later. And it wasn't until the following day, which was Monday the 27th, when Chelsea still didn't return home, that the panic really started to set in. Now, when Chelsea's family couldn't get a hold of her, they started contacting everyone they knew. They filled out missing persons reports for Chelsea as well as contacted her friends and Big Mike. Now, let's talk about Big Mike for a second. So, we said that he was in a heavy metal band. However, Big Mike's real name is Mike Williams, and the farm that he had his party on is his mother's farm, like I said, that he basically grew up on his whole life. 
According to Mike, he said that on Monday, which was the 27th, he started receiving Facebook messages from people asking if he knew where Chelsea was. Now, according to Mike, he said that at first, he didn't even really know who Chelsea was at all because there were so many people at that party. You can't really blame him for not knowing every single person, all 700 that are at that party. So he didn't really know who Chelsea was. However, after getting all of these messages, he decided that he was gonna go walk around his property, walk the perimeter of his property to see if he could find anything. He said that he took his dog and the two of them started walking around the property. Now, Mike said they actually walked about several miles before his dog ended up getting caught in a fox trap. And once this happened, he ended up taking his dog back to his trailer that he lived in on his mom's property. And when he got back, he was surprised to see Chelsea's family on his property. Now, Mike has said from the very beginning, he definitely felt like he was being blamed for Chelsea's disappearance because she was last seen on his property. He said that Chelsea's mom basically directly asked him when she showed up to his property, if he was keeping Chelsea in the basement, where she was, if he had her locked up somewhere, which Mike said he took a lot of offense to because he was out there looking and searching and trying to find her as well. But because he felt like he was being scrutinized by everyone, it really did make him not want to be involved at all and not want to help at all. He said that Chelsea's family immediately set up a tent and an entire camp at his property to look for Chelsea without even ever asking him. However, Mike said he contacted his lawyers to see how he should handle the situation. And that is when his lawyers said to just kind of let Chelsea's family do their thing and set up camp for a little bit and that this would eventually die down, which is advice that Mike said he listened to. Now, according to Chelsea's mother she said that she didn't even know that chelsea was going out to a party that night and had she had known she said quote 22 or not she would have not been going to a party where there were 700 people and honestly the size of this party is where a lot of the police's initial problems in this investigation began because to put it in context let's say that this was a 20 person house party and chelsea went there and went missing and hadn't been heard from or seen but she was last seen at this house party what authorities would do is track down every single person out of the 20 people that went to that party and basically look at them in their initial suspect pool and then rule out people along the way. However, because this was a 700 person party, authorities knew that there was absolutely no way that they could go through all 700 people that were there, considering the fact that Mike didn't even know every single person that was there. There was no way to track down every single person that was at this party. And this also wasn't just any type of party. This was a Halloween party. This was a costume party. So people are walking around disguising themselves as something else. So not only is this a 700 person party, but it's a 700 person party where people are trying to disguise their identity. So it definitely gave police a very big disadvantage in the beginning. Now, when police initially started their investigation, they asked Chelsea's friends what her love life looked like, if she was dating anyone, if there was anyone in particular. And while Chelsea's friends did tell authorities that there were multiple people that Chelsea Chelsea was interested and had her eye on. Chelsea was single and she did not have a boyfriend. However, even so, authorities tried to see if any of the guys that Chelsea was interested in could have seen her that night, maybe dropped her off somewhere or offered her a ride. So they went through the list of those guys and were able to rule every single one of them out as having any possibility in being the last person that saw Chelsea. Now, while continuing their investigation, authorities were able to get in contact with six different people that said that they saw Chelsea at Big Mike's party and that they also let Chelsea borrow their phone because remember, Chelsea did not have her phone that night. So these six people let Chelsea borrow their phone while she called Becky and Penny asking where they were. Now, according to Penny, she said that when she got this phone call from Chelsea, she answered the phone and Chelsea was on the other line. And when Penny was on the phone with Chelsea, this is when Chelsea asked Penny, if she could come back to the party and pick Chelsea up. However, Penny said 
no. And Penny's reasoning for saying no is because she had kids, she had been drinking, she didn't think it was smart to go back out and drive again, and she figured that Chelsea would just get a ride from another friend like she had initially thought. And according to Penny, she said that Chelsea didn't seem very upset by this. She actually seemed very understanding. However, according to the people who let Chelsea borrow their phone, Chelsea was very visibly upset. She was crying. She was saying that she had no friends, that her friends ditched her. So she was clearly upset about this and upset enough to call Penny again to ask her to come pick her up. And I can imagine how upset you would be, especially after drinking because emotions are heightened when you're told by your friend that they're not gonna come and pick you back up. So a couple days after the party and in the middle of the police investigation, authorities got a phone call from a woman and this woman claimed that her son was also at the party that night and that he saw Chelsea. The woman said her son remembers talking to Chelsea because he remembers her wearing her poison ivy costume and he also remembers that while he was talking to Chelsea, there was a guy kind of like lingering over Chelsea, comforting her because like I said, she was visibly upset. Her friends had just ditched her. So this guy was trying to comfort her and was kind of putting his arm around her and not really leaving when Chelsea was talking to this other guy. And this was where police were able to come up with a composite sketch. When asked to give a physical description, the woman's son described this man as a taller and skinnier guy. He had hair that swooped across his face, almost like an early Justin Bieber hair, as well as glasses. Now, once they were given this description, the son was asked to meet with a sketch artist to come up with a composite sketch and once they were able to do that they put the sketch out into the media now the problem with this sketch was like I said a bunch of people could have looked like this guy this was a very average looking person and along with that again Halloween party someone could have disguised themselves to look like this in general now even though the sketch did kind of seem like your average looking guy there were a lot of phone calls that came into authorities from people claiming that they knew who this was or that they saw this person but many different people claimed to know many different versions of this guy it wasn't that they collected collectively were naming one person. It was that every single person was naming a different person that looked like this guy, which ultimately led police to nowhere. So let's talk about Mike again. Mike was brought into police questioning where he informed police that he didn't know Chelsea personally, but he did know of her. He also denied police access to search his home, which they then went forward with anyways after getting a search warrant. However, his home came up with nothing. Now, even though they weren't completely convinced that Mike didn't have anything to do with it. It was at this time that a new tip came in. Now, someone had called into the police department to tell them that they should look into a new guy. And this guy was 19 year old Harlan Bird. According to Harlan, he went to this party with his best friend. And while he was there later in the night, he saw a girl who he claimed to be Chelsea. He said that he saw Chelsea being shoved to the ground in between these two guys so that she was kind of in the middle being pushed back and forth and he came in as the knight in shining armor and helped Chelsea up, pushed the guys away. When asked to describe Chelsea, Harlan was able to do so to a T but something that stood out to authorities is that he didn't describe Chelsea how she was that night in her poison ivy costume with the wig and the costume and like exactly what she was wearing that night. He described Chelsea as what she looked like on a regular day. So after Harlan said he got Chelsea up from the ground and pushed these guys away. He said that he really didn't know what to do with Chelsea, so he ended up putting her inside this red pickup truck. He told her to sit and wait there while he went back into the party and looked for her friends, which Harlan said he did. He said he went back into the party to look for Chelsea's friends and he looked around for about 15 minutes but couldn't find any of Chelsea's friends. So he ended up walking back out to the truck that he had left Chelsea in. And that is when he saw that the car and Chelsea were both gone. So at first authorities had a lot of problems with Harlan's story. They thought it was very possible that he was just trying to make himself look like the hero in this situation when in reality he could have been responsible for Chelsea's disappearance so they started to press him a little bit more and he basically straight up asked him did you rape her did you kill her did you have anything to do with her disappearance and this is when Harlan started to unravel a little bit he said no he had nothing to do with her disappearance and he actually ended up coming clean and saying that he had made up this entire story he said that he told authorities this story because he was trying to make himself look better 
better in this situation. He had absolutely nothing to do with Chelsea's disappearance, didn't even see her that night, and authorities ended up arresting Harland for lying to the authorities. Then on a Sunday in late March, so a couple months after Chelsea's disappearance, there was a woman who called into the authorities, and she had lived about 2.8 miles away from where Big Mike's party was held, and her name is Cheryl Retzloff. Cheryl called into the authorities because she said that she was taking her usual walk around the property and she came across a shoe. Cheryl said that it wasn't uncommon for her to find objects around her property just because there was a lot of cars that drove by her house because she lived on a busy street. But she said that the shoe was a leather flat shoe and that it was red. Cheryl had originally thrown the shoe in the trash and it wasn't until Cheryl's husband came home and the two of them had a conversation about the shoe that Cheryl's husband brought it to her attention. What if it's Chelsea's shoe. At first, Cheryl said that she thought that that was absolutely ridiculous. It had been months since Chelsea went missing, so why all of a sudden, after they had gone through the entire winter, why would Chelsea's shoe just now be showing up? However, Cheryl decided that it was better to be safe than sorry, so she ended up contacting the authorities, and they came and picked up the shoe, and it was the following day that Chelsea's mom was able to confirm that the shoe found on Cheryl's property did, in fact, belong to Chelsea. Now there was a guy named Eric who lived in the same area of Monroe County and Eric often did what is called scrapping. Scrapping is where you go out and search for items in either bushes or land or anywhere really and look for items that could potentially have value. It's basically kind of like using a metal detector to find valuable items and Eric said at this time he was kind of in between a rock and a hard place financially so he was out looking for items that could potentially be valuable. Eric and his friend ended up going into an abandoned building. And I say building very loosely. I have the picture up right now. The roof was completely thrown off of this place and it had barely any windows or really any stability throughout it. The building was about 10 miles away from where Big Mike's party was. And according to Eric, when they walked into the building, they found what they first thought to be a fake plant. However, when they picked up this fake plant, they realized that it wasn't a fake plant, but in fact, it was actually a costume that someone had sewn leaves onto. Along with this costume, Eric said he also found a maroon wig. Now, according to Eric, he said that he wasn't really familiar with Chelsea nor the fact that she was missing at the time and didn't really know a lot about the case, so he didn't put two and two together when he saw the costume and the wig. However, just seeing a wig in general just kind of freaked him out and he didn't want to pick it up, so he ended up just leaving both of the items there and walking out. About a week later, Eric said that he saw a missing persons poster for Chelsea posted up and saw that she was wearing the costume costume and the maroon wig on the night that she went missing. And this is when he kind of put two and two together. However, at first, Eric was very suspicious as to whether or not he should come forward and say anything. Reason being was that he had personally picked up the poison ivy costume and wasn't wearing gloves or anything. So he was afraid that because of that, his DNA was going to be on the costume and that authorities would think that he had something to do with her disappearance. However, during this little dilemma that he was having, Eric ended up going going to lunch with his sister and his sister basically told him you're gonna call the police or I am essentially that's kind of the ultimatum that she gave him which is when Eric decided it would be best for him to call the authorities and let them know what he discovered now when authorities went and found Chelsea's costume it was found with the straps and bottom ripped and when police got a hold of it the first thing that they did was bring Eric in for questioning kind of to strengthen Eric's point and his fear of what would happen, it's kind of exactly what did end up happening. The authorities thought it was very strange that Eric just so happened to stumble upon Chelsea's Halloween costume. However, Eric was adamant on the fact that he did not know Chelsea and he wasn't even at the party the night that she went missing. Eric told authorities that he was at home with his daughter the weekend that Chelsea went missing and he willingly gave up his DNA and fingerprints to the authorities and then he was ultimately cleared of having any possible involvement. Now, in terms of the location that Chelsea's costume was found in, that weird abandoned building, there was a strange connection that authorities made. Authorities were able to figure out that where Chelsea's costume was found was, in the detective's words, quote, 
200 yards tops from where Harlan Bird lived. You could practically see the building from Harlan's residence, end quote. Now remember, Harlan was the guy who said that he saved Chelsea. He was her knight in shining armor and then made the whole story up. So because of this coincidence, authorities brought Harlan in again for a second interview because they thought it was extremely strange and very coincidental that Chelsea's costume was found so close to where Harlan lived. Harlan did bring an attorney for this second interview and said that even though he had been to that abandoned building before, he had no idea why Chelsea's costume ended up there and that he had absolutely no part in it and nothing to do with it. Harlan agreed to give authorities his DNA and to take a polygraph test to prove his innocence and he actually ended up passing this polygraph test. So now we move on to April 24th, 2015, and we move to an area that is about seven miles away from where Big Mike's party was held. Now this location was actually a construction site because there was a man who was building a home on this particular property. And on April 24th, there was a dump truck that was pulled up onto the property because there was a piece of the land that needed to be filled. Honestly, I am, I have no idea what that means. I don't know construction like that. It's okay because that is not what's important here because what is important here was that when this truck was backing up and started filling up this particular area, the truck actually got stuck in the mud. This caused the truck driver to have to get out of the car and go behind the truck to see if he could try and push the truck out of the mud. And while he was pushing this truck out of the mud, the truck driver discovered a dead body. Now the property owner is actually the one who immediately called 911 to report that there had been a dead body on his property. He said that the body was a female, she had blonde hair, and he thinks that it was the same girl who went missing and that has been posted all over town. Now authorities immediately went over to the property and when that happened, they were able to identify that the body was in fact Chelsea Brooke. Chelsea's body had been found covered in logs and branches as if someone had tried to conceal it. And nearby where her body was discovered was an artificial leaf, the same one that had been on Chelsea's costume that night. The police said that when they discovered the body, they went to Chelsea's parents' house directly and broke the news to them because they didn't want them to hear it any other way. And once Chelsea's family heard the news, the media was all over this case. The news that the body had been found was blasted all over the media, and as far as the autopsy results went, the medical examiner concluded that Chelsea's cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. Chelsea also had several facial bones that were fractured, and Chelsea's parents ended up holding a private funeral for her. So now that they have recovered Chelsea's body, the next big question here is what happened? How did we get here? Who did this, and why would anyone ever want to hurt Chelsea. Now the day after Chelsea's body was discovered was when the crime lab actually called the authorities and told them that they had found DNA on the poison ivy costume of Chelsea's that was found in the abandoned building. They said that of course Chelsea's DNA was found on the costume, however there was another unidentified male's DNA found on it as well. They ran Eric's DNA as well as Harlan's DNA and neither of theirs matched this other unidentified male's DNA. So Harlan and Eric at this point were pretty much cleared from any involvement. A couple months after Chelsea's body was discovered in September 2015, her other shoe was also discovered on the same property that her body was discovered on. So that same man that was building that house where Chelsea's body was discovered, months later they discovered her other shoe as well. So at this point, authorities had the entire costume. They had the wig, they had the actual poison ivy costume, and they also had both of the shoes as well. Then there was a break in the case. And this break in the case came from the crime lab when they were finally able to match the DNA found on Chelsea's costume to a man named Daniel Clay. Now, Daniel Clay hadn't even been on the police's radar at all throughout this entire investigation. They really had no idea who he was. After looking into Daniel Clay, they were able to figure out that he was an unemployed guy who didn't have a permanent address, but would just kind of live 
with whoever he was dating at that particular time. He also had several children as well. Now, the reason that they were able to match the DNA at all was because Michigan had actually recently come out with a new law. And this new law stated that anyone who got arrested, no matter how minor the charge was, would have their DNA taken. So Daniel had gotten arrested for a minor unrelated charge. And because of that, they were then able to match his DNA with the DNA on Chelsea's costume. Authorities were also able to figure out that Daniel also had two warrants out for his arrest for unpaid child support. So that is how they were able to arrest him. And their plan was to arrest him for his unpaid child support warrants and not tell him anything about Chelsea until after he was arrested. And he ended up getting arrested in July, 2016. Now, during this interrogation, authorities started to ask him about Big Mike's party. And according to Daniel, he said that he did attend the party. He got there about 8 or 9 p.m. and ended up leaving at about 10 or 11 p.m. He told authorities that he didn't know Chelsea, had never seen Chelsea before in his life. And I'm going to look over here to read you this quote. He actually described himself as, quote, a very peaceful guy. I don't like violence. All I like is smoking weed and having sex. That's his literal word for word quote on himself. Now, because Daniel was so adamant on the fact that he didn't know Chelsea, had never seen Chelsea before, investigators decided that it was a good idea to tell him that they had his DNA on Chelsea's costume. And this is when Daniel's story ended up changing. Daniel then told authorities that he did hook up with someone that night. He did sleep with someone that night, but he doesn't know who it was. It very well could have been Chelsea, but he doesn't know. And he said because his DNA was on Chelsea's costume that it might've been Chelsea that he slept with, but he was very adamant on the fact that the sex that they had was consensual and that she was completely fine when he left her. Now, the investigators knew that they needed to do something to get Daniel to start talking because clearly he wasn't just going to openly admit to having something to do with Chelsea's disappearance. So this is when the detective interviewing Daniel had told Daniel that Chelsea had something called brittle bone disease and that her bones are easily broken. So if something did happen, it was probably an accident because she has this brittle bone disease, which by the way, Chelsea did not have brittle bone disease. This was just a tactic used by the detective to try and get Daniel to start talking. The detective said that when he told Daniel this, he could quote, see the wheels start to turn in Daniel's head. And this is when Daniel came up with a new story. Daniel told authorities that he was driving home from the party and saw Chelsea walking on the side of the road. And he asked her if she wanted a ride to which she accepted. Daniel said once Chelsea got in the car, things got a little heated and that the two of them had concerns sensual sex together. And then Daniel said that Chelsea had asked him to choke her, which Daniel said that he did. However, at one point, Chelsea just stopped breathing. Daniel made it very clear to authorities that he had multiple girlfriends in the past who enjoyed being choked and that he, quote, knew how to do it. However, something just went wrong in this situation. And because the detective had put this brittle bone disease in his head, that is when Daniel told authorities, oh, it must have been the brittle bone disease. That must have been what had happened. Now, instead of going to the hospital, Daniel said that he attempted to perform CPR. However, it was unsuccessful. And then that is when he drugged Chelsea, put her in the back of his truck, and then drove her to the location that her body was discovered at. Daniel was very adamant though throughout this entire story that he does not know how Chelsea's costume got to be in that abandoned building, which was five miles away from where her body was discovered. However, authorities believe he does know and just does not want to say how it got there. After admitting to police what he had done, Daniel was arrested for Chelsea murder and before being booked he ended up calling the mother of one of his kids and told her that he was going to be going to jail for a very long time now what's crazy is that this mother of Daniel's kid the one that he called actually was a co-worker of Chelsea's they worked at the same restaurant together which is a really weird connection if you think about it so when Daniel was arrested for murder he actually pled not guilty claiming that he didn't mean to kill Chelsea this case ended up going to trial now the prosecution said that because there were no eyewitnesses, the only person who really knows what happened that night
Clay is Daniel Clay. They also said that the circumstances, you know, Chelsea being alone, not having a phone, not having a ride, and it being cold outside could have very well led her to asking Daniel for a ride home or accepting one if he had offered. However, what happened after that is still unknown. Now, the prosecution argued that Daniel, when offering Chelsea a ride, had made advances towards Chelsea, which she rejected, which ultimately led to Daniel snapping and murdering Chelsea. And again, Daniel was arguing that this was all an accident, that he had choked Chelsea at her request for about 20 to 30 seconds and she just died. However, the medical examiner ended up taking the stand and said that it was actually impossible for Chelsea or anyone to have passed away from choking in just 20 to 30 seconds. She said that the process takes a lot longer than that. According to her, she said it usually takes two and a half to three minutes of constant pressure to choke someone to death. Then on May 16th, 2017, after only a couple hours of deliberation, Daniel Clay was found guilty of first degree murder. And then on July 13th, 2017, Daniel was sentenced to life in prison. Chelsea's mom spoke at the sentencing where she said that she forgave Daniel for what he did because if she didn't, it would ruin the rest of her life. However, even though she forgives, she will never be able to forget what happened and what he did. She also gifted Daniel with a Bible and said that she hoped that he would be able to bring Jesus into his life. And Daniel again apologized to Chelsea's mother. So that is the case of Chelsea Brook. It has a lot of twists and turns. However, ultimately, I'm very glad that Chelsea got justice for what happened to her and that Daniel will be spending the rest of his life in prison. So that is this case. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below. I would love to hear your thoughts. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Hollow Week episode. Bye, guys.